I enlisted in the Army because um, uh, my father had been in the Army. Uh, I was one of these individuals that went to ROTC in high school. Uh, there was an active duty sergeant that was on the ROTC cadre that I learned to respect and had a lot of respect for. And, and I knew that uh, between my, the influence of my father and the, the sergeant that I was going to go in the Army. Drew Dix volunteered for the Army at 18 with the idea of joining the Special Forces. His youth kept him out of the program, so he began his service in the regular Army instead. By January of 1968, Dix was a Special Forces advisor working with the CIA in the vicinity of the city of Chow Dok, near the Cambodian border. It was the eve of one of the war's turning points, a massive Viet Cong invasion on the New Year holiday of Tet. At that time of war, the U.S. government and the Allies and, uh, and the, the, the communists were trying to find every reason to have a ceasefire. We, for political reasons, to back out a little bit, I think, and the communists to give them more time to get organized and do more what they were going to do. So when uh, the word came down that there would be a ceasefire for, I believe, three days, I, I don't remember totally now, uh, I knew that, that something wasn't right. My business was intelligence. I knew the area of where we were operating, and so I had put together a patrol and went up near the border and got into a minor skirmish. Just when we were trying to uh, determine where our support was going to come from if we got into a heavy, heavy battle, uh, I got on the radio and found out that Chow Duck was uh, under attack. So we headed back to see what we could do. We approached the city, and I, we landed on the, on the beach, and, and we got quite a bit of fire. The enemy, at that time, it was clear that they had totally infiltrated the city before they had initiated their attack. I think they thought they were going to fight their way in, but it was far easier than they thought. And they performed a magnificent, clever, infiltration in all these these cities. Once we got into the city, um, we could see it was a major offensive. No help was coming, and things were really bad. They were worse than I thought. The city was totally under control of the, the BC. I learned that uh, some civilians had been uh, killed or captured, and uh, uh, Maggie Francott, her, her name at the time, this civilian volunteer nurse, hadn't been heard from for a while. And I was told that she was probably killed or captured, uh, as well as some other Americans. Uh, her house was not that far from our compound, and I, I said, we need to go uh, check out and see what was happened to Maggie. And that was the beginning of, the, of taking back Chowda. We went to look for Maggie uh, at her house right away because we were told that's where she was. And we were receiving quite a bit of fire along the way from the enemy. You could see out of the corner of your eye the scurrying on top of the building. So we were trying to get a position on it, and we just, we just kept going. We pulled up to uh, Maggie's house, and it didn't look good because she had a, an international scout with her issued vehicle. And they, could have been a thousand bullet holes in it. The tires were flat, the windows were out, rounds had been hit building in, in, the, in the yard. And it just didn't look good. And uh, there was an iron gate across the building and, and it was locked. Couldn't get in. And I thought, well, shoot the lock off, but uh, that didn't work. It, it, we didn't try, but it wouldn't work. And uh, we saw some enemy run out the back room. And I went to the side of the building to make sure they didn't run out and back along the wall. We left a couple of the Navy SEALs and, and some of the um, indigenous troops that were with me on the vehicles and we were suppressing fire. I'm talking to Jim, yelling back and forth. It was a little bit, it was loud there and we're standing right there together at this gate, frustrated, we can't get in. I'm thinking about going around, but there were some enemy back there. So I called out, I said, Maggie, you know, and, and uh, Nothing at first, and then I heard somebody said, yeah, it's me. <laughs> at this point, 
Um, it was really, really getting loud and, and the gunfire and the shooting. And they had rocketed a hole in my kitchen wall and one in the back wall. And I could hear the Akong outside my bedroom door shooting. And then I heard um, Jim and Drew must have driven up because all of a sudden next I heard, Maggie, Maggie. <laughs> so I ran to the front door, which had the metal grate on. And in doing so, the Viet Cong were running the opposite way. I mean, we were like this, we're passing each other, and I'm looking at them, and they're looking at me. And they were surprised to see me there. And um, um, somebody said, the key, the key, find the key. I remember at the time saying, well, get the key. And I know how dumb that must have sounded, because the building was totally in shambles. This is all this rubble, and luckily, the key just happened to be right under the first level of of ceiling plaster. She turned around and picked up the key, and there it was, and unlocked it, and then we got her out. But uh, very, very fortunate, very lucky. Uh, um, kind of felt like things are going to turn out because she wasn't killed. For the next two days, Dix and his handful of indigenous troops fought house to house, rescuing over two dozen trapped civilians and conveying them to safety. Weathering constant enemy fire, Dix's tiny force wrested control of critical buildings from the VC, killing scores of enemy troops and capturing a litany of prisoners, one of whom was a key Viet Cong operative. We started getting a momentum. I started feeling good about what we were accomplishing. The indigenous troops that were enjoying a holiday uh, started joining us, falling in behind us. I mean, when you have six indigenous troops and all of a sudden you're up to maybe 14 or 15, you feel really good. Each time we pursued taking over some of the, the high buildings, the big compounds, each time we took one of those over, by having a few of the others that joined us, I was able to leave somebody there. Because if you didn't do that, then as soon as you leave, they're gonna come right back. It's kind of like they were fighting the whole Vietnam War. You know, you take a piece of ground and you left. And they came back. And I said, we're not gonna fall for that trap. So I left two or three wounded at every one of those key intersections. And we were able to uh, take back Chow Duck. The liberation of Chow Doc lasted some 56 hours, during which more than 200 enemy were killed or captured. The incident was a rare, decisive victory in the otherwise panicked chaos of Tet. For the final time during my presidency, this house is graced with the company of the heroes who have scaled heights known only to a very few men in this land. The ceremony was an incredible ceremony because it was the last one that President Johnson was going to do before he left office in two days. It was a joint ceremony. They had an Army, Navy, Air Force, um, and a Marine. So they read the citation, and he leaned over and whispered something in, in my, my ear. And I won't repeat it, but uh, it was very personal. And it was almost like he knew what it would have been like. In fact, there's a photograph of him leaning over and whispering something there in the middle, in the middle of this ceremony. And I, the first thing I thought of was, I wonder if everybody could hear that. <laughs> Those of us that wear the Medal of Honor know that there are so many other soldiers, airmen, Marines, that have done acts that, that just weren't recognized that, because there were no witnesses left. So I'm very proud to be able to wear the Medal of Honor for all of those that, that performed deeds far greater than I did. You know, whether it's in the military and you have a military commitment, or whether it's in the private sector or in school, you can't let, you don't let your, your buddies on the left and the right down. You just do what's right and they'll do it for you. And that's what makes this country so great. <laughs>